My name is Don Waisaki. This is the uh, variety development and performance research uh, session. We have uh, three presenters today. The first one is uh, Mike Stam. He's at Kansas State University. Uh, he is the canola breeder at Kansas State, and Mike's going to talk about some of the things that they've been doing in his program. Well, I appreciate the invitation to come uh, today and present on uh, some perspectives on varieties and variety development from the Southern Great Plains. And uh, you might wonder why a guy from the Southern Great Plains is here to talk uh, to growers in the PNW. Well, uh, there are a lot of similarities, I think, between our two uh, regions. And one of those similarities is that uh, there's a lot of potential for uh, winter canola acreage expansion in the Southern Great Plains and from the graph here you can see a fairly dramatic increase uh, in acres over the last several gr uh, growing seasons. However, this past growing season with the nasty winter that we had and the drought conditions, uh, we had a little bit of setback in our acreage increase. Uh, but the U.S. Canola Association did set a goal for about 1.5 million acres in the Southern Great Plains by 2018. When you look at the plant hardiness zones map from the USDA, uh, this is a map of the average annual extreme minimum temperatures for, by region. And you can see that uh, in the PNW, are actually our plant hardiness zones are very similar, uh, especially kind of in that central Oklahoma, Kansas uh, corridor. And those red circles kind of indicate where the, the major cusp of the winter canola acres are in the southern Great Plains. We've got that big long area there in what we call the wheat belt of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, uh, where we're seeing acreage expansion also in the panhandles of both Texas and Oklahoma and southwest Kansas under some irrigated uh, conditions, and then a pocket up in northwest uh, Colorado and uh, the panhandle of Nebraska, where we're seeing some expansion of winter canola as well. So from that perspective, we have similar climates. Uh, we do get a fair amount more uh, precipitation in Kansas than what uh, we get here in Washington. And you would think that we'd be able to grow some pretty fantastic winter canola, and we can do that. The problem is we have a very uh, major distribution problem with that rainfall where we'll have a stretch of three or four months where we, it won't really want to rain, and then we'll get a June or an August where we'll have uh, eight or ten inches of rain. And that doesn't do anybody a lot of good. And so the distribution of that uh, rainfall can be a factor in our ability to grow winter canola. And in Kansas, these are the top 10 counties for canola production. The, the most acres in one county is 29,000, and that's there on the southern uh, border with uh, Oklahoma. Uh, but this is the area of the state where there's a lot of continuous wheat. So a lot of the same reasons for introducing winter canola in, in Washington state hold true for the Southern Great Plains because we do grow a lot of wheat and a lot of continuous wheat. So from our uh, perspective on breeding, uh, we have been trying to develop varieties in Kansas and the Southern Great Plains that are adapted to our climate over the past approximately 20 uh, years or so. And there are a number of different traits that we are looking for in our germplasm, and this is just a kind of a brief overview of those uh, traits. Uh, but we want to build some diversity in our germplasm uh, because our environment can be um, uh, very diverse, very different from year to year. Um, and so some of the traits that we're interested in are oil quality and quantity, uh, winter survival, disease tolerance, herbicide resistance is very important to us, especially having ability to use glyphosate and other grass chemistries to control feral rye, uh, cheat, downy brome. We have a big issue with sulfonylurea herbicide carryover in winter wheat, and so we need varieties that are tolerant to sulfonylurea herbicides. And then we're also developing a range of maturities in our materials, as well as uh, varieties that are both uh, forage, can be used for forage and grain production. I'd say winter survival is probably the trait that we've uh, contributed the most to the current germplasm pool that we use uh, in the southern Great Plains. and. Um, when we first started looking at winter canola back in the uh, mid 80s, late or early 1990s, uh, we really didn't have anything that could survive the extremes of our, our climate. And so uh, that's been the main thrust of the, the breeding program over the last 20 years. And 
These are some varieties here in this table that are commonly grown out here in, in the PNW. And so uh, I figured I would pull some of those varieties out and highlight those uh, with uh, some of their winter survival ratings for our climate here. This is five Great Plains locations from 13, 2013 and 2014 with a survival rating uh, from one uh, to five. And some of those names you might recognize again from the PNW um, uh, variety trials because they were grown this uh, past year. Uh, with, and in this table, the, the one rating is uh, the best winter survival, 100% survival, five rating is zero survival. So uh, the varieties that are currently grown have a pretty good range in their uh, winter tolerance. We're also interested in disease tolerance, and I think this is going to become more and more uh, important as acres continue to grow in the southern Great Plains. Uh, we see blackleg uh, about every third or fourth year we'll have uh, an infestation of blackleg, and so we're trying to incorporate some resistance into our varieties here. And this is just a, some information that I pulled out of a study that uh, Oklahoma State has done over the past uh, three years, giving field ratings for severity. Uh, to current commercial varieties and then some of the experimental varieties in our program. And so uh, right now, uh, I would say most of the material in our program uh, has some moderate resistance to a black leg. And I think that's going to contribute uh, as we move forward to the, the acreage expansion as, as black leg becomes uh, more of an issue. And then the Roundup Ready uh, trait is also very important, but this is a trait, of course, that we have to use a good stewardship with. Uh, you heard a presentation earlier about the disease-resistant issues that we have in the Southern Great Plains, and that's only becoming uh, worse because uh, most farmers are heavy users of glyphosate. So this is something that we have to use a lot of stewardship uh, with, but it is also very important because of the broad spectrum control that we get of our winter annual grassy and broadleaf weeds. And so over the past couple of years, we've uh, been able to release some uh, winter uh, Roundup Ready varieties out of our program. And we'll have three on the market within the next two years. Uh, one variety, DKW 4525, uh, should be available in the fall. And then High Class 220 and High Class 225 are also two varieties out of our program uh, that should be available, I would think, uh, within a year and a half. Um, but this is some variety trial data from uh, Oklahoma. Uh, we do a lot of testing down there, um, comparing our materials to the, the most uh, popular uh, commercial materials. And uh, our material is very competitive with what's currently on the market in terms of uh, Roundup Ready resistance. And in terms of uh, varieties, uh, this is a, a lot of information here. Um, but these are the, the current varieties that we've uh, released out of our program. And I've mentioned already the, the three uh, Roundup Ready varieties that we have current, or recently released. Uh, we have one other that we've licensed to Monsanto uh, that they're looking for a home for. And then we have several conventional varieties. And I mentioned the, the dual purpose varieties uh, that we're working on, the dual purpose trait. We do have one variety, Griffin, that we uh, release for both uh, forage and grain uh, production as well as as well as several other conventional varieties that have been around for a number of years. One of the other uh, major focuses of our program is coordinating the National Winter Canola Variety Trial. Uh, this is a, a trial uh, that is planted in around uh, 20 states uh, in the U.S. And the primary objectives are to evaluate uh, experimental varieties and hybrids in a, a very wide range of environments. Uh, we want to help um, seed suppliers and marketers uh, determine where their commercial varieties or hybrids could be marketed in, in the U.S. Uh, most states in the uh, United States don't have their own uh, canola variety testing um, program. We have the Idaho-Washington uh, variety trials. We have uh, North Dakota State, Kansas State, Oklahoma State has their own variety trials. But most other states that are interested in using or introducing winter canola into their cropping systems don't have local or regional variety trials. And so um, this trial is the, thus a service to those other universities and states uh, to evaluate uh, the adaptability, the profitability, the performance of a winter canola in their region. So we want to do what we can to increase the visibility of winter canola as an alternative crop um, in the U.S. 
And then the information that we provide can be used as a variety selection tool by uh, breeders, by producers, agronomists, uh, seed salesmen, and uh, processors as well. So for this past year, as I mentioned, the trial was planted in 20 states at around 52 locations, around 11 breeding programs contributed. Uh, there are 23 commercial products in this trial, and breaking those out, uh, we see 33 hybrids and 21 open pollinated varieties. We're starting to see a shift towards more hybrids in the trial, uh, and around 17 have uh, herbicide tolerance, and we're also seeing a, a new trait, the semi-dwarfing trait, uh, which helps with reducing plant height and also keeping the, the rosette or crown uh, close to the ground in the fall. We're seeing six uh, hybrids with that trait in the trial now. Looking back at previous year's history of the National Variety Trial, this breaks out the entries by year. Here you can see the number of experimental varieties versus uh, the number of uh, commercial varieties. And actually, we've seen uh, an uptick of experimental varieties or hybrids in the trial over the past several years as more uh, industry partners are entering experimentals into the trial uh, to see if there's anything that, that might work. And then looking at those same entry numbers, uh, breaking out the open pollinated and hybrid varieties, you can see quite a trend uh, for an increase in the number of hybrids that we're evaluating in the trial now. And if you go to most of the major uh, winter canola or, or oilseed rape growing regions around the world, uh, most of those, uh, those regions or uh, states or nations are, are growing hybrids now. And so we're starting to see that um, come into the U.S. market as well. These are the seed suppliers for the 2014-15 national trial. You can see most of the major seed companies uh, in the U.S. Um, are participants. And you can see the number of entries and the number of commercial products they have. Uh, we have companies like uh, Syngenta uh, that are just starting to get into this uh, winter uh, canola market or experimenting with uh, their varieties, seeing what the interest might be. Uh, I think this is really key uh, as we move forward with the, the winter canola market as a whole in the U.S. Is we need this uh, industry competition and, and participation. And this is probably really difficult to read in the back, uh, but this is a breakdown of uh, the entries uh, with the developer of those uh, entries, whether they're an open pollinated variety or a hybrid. Uh, what trait they might possess, uh, and whether or not that variety is commercially available uh, in the U.S. or not. Um, if you're interested in any of this information, uh, please uh, contact me, and I would be very happy uh, to share it uh, with you. But again, just to point out uh, the diversity in the number of, of varieties, the different options that we have in terms of traits, um, and then the different types we're seeing, open pollinated hybrids, um, now and more and more products uh, on the market uh, each year. And one of the perks of coordinating this trial is that I get to see uh, some of the, the new traits from industry and I had already uh, mentioned uh, the semi-dwarfing trait which I think is going to be a key trait or an important trait uh, with helping us in our ability to survive uh, winter conditions in the southern Great Plains. Um, but a lot of the other, uh, maybe the, the those companies that don't have those traits in their, um, that specific semi-dwarfing trait in their program may have other traits that they are working on as well. And I think most of the industry uh, partners now are working on having varieties that have this prostrate growth habit in the fall. That's a very, very critical trait for our region because um, we have an issue sometimes with uh, planting moisture in the fall. And so being able to seed early when the moisture is available about having those varieties hug the ground and don't, um, don't show any uh, fall stem elongation. Uh, th that's really critical. If they show that fall stem elongation, then we also often have uh, major issues with winter kill. And if you come to our session on winter kill, I'll talk a lot about that early planting and how uh, that, can, that can cause uh, fall stem elongation in our materials. But it's nice to see that a lot of the industry partners now are working on this prostrate growth habit. Uh, a lot of uh, industry partners are working on oil content as well as SU carryover tolerance. Uh, we're evaluating our first uh, winter hybrids with pod shatter tolerance uh, in them. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see how they perform in a southern Great Plains environment. 
Uh, we're starting to see more clear field uh, hybrids as well as uh, soon to see the true flex roundup ready canola come into the, the winter canola market. Um, that's a, a couple of years down the road, I believe. And then we're also seeing more specialty oil, high oleic, low lin uh, type uh, oil profiles. These are the locations for the national trial this uh, past year. And you don't, don't see any up in the Pacific Northwest, and that's primarily uh, because your program or your environment is serviced by Jack's uh, program at Idaho, as well as uh, Frank uh, here in Washington. Uh, so they have similar varieties in their trials uh, compared to what we have, and so there's a little bit of overlap there. Uh, but we're primarily focused in that central corridor, again, of the, the Great Plains region. Uh, but then we also have locations as well in the, the Mid-South, uh, the southeast part of the U.S., and we stretch anywhere from North Dakota up to Vermont, uh, down to Georgia. And another perk of these, uh, being able to coordinate these trials is you get to visit locations like uh, Tennessee and Kentucky and the College Station, Texas, you know, very exotic locations uh, for growing winter canola. But it's, it's really neat to see the different uh, varied performance of these um, different hybrids being brought in from overseas especially. And what works in one region definitely doesn't work in another region. And so uh, that's why there's such a diversity in the germplasm in this trial is uh, hopefully by testing all of it, we'll find something that works uh, for a particular uh, region. Just to give you an idea of uh, the yields that we've seen in the trial, this past year uh, was not a record setting year for yields for winter canola. Most every location in the U.S. had extreme cold over at least some period of the winter, and that really affected yields. Uh, yields in the Great Plains region were affected by the cold winter, as well as uh, major drought uh, conditions in the spring. And so yields were, were very, very uh, low for that um, reason. Uh, but quite a range in yields. Um, and if you go to our publications. Uh, you can download these uh, from online at uh, this website uh, from K-State Research and Extension. If you want to see uh, how these varieties and hybrids that are similar uh, to this PNW region, how they might perform in other uh, parts of the U.S., uh, this would be a good resource for you to thumb through or to have. And with that, um, that probably takes up close to my 15 minutes. Uh, if you ever have any questions about varieties or performance of the uh, performance data, would like to get your hands on some information, uh, please uh, feel free to contact me. Be glad to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, the question was, what is TrueFlex Roundup Ready? That's their Generation 2 Roundup Ready uh, gene. It allows for uh, a higher application rate and a broader, a broader uh, application window. So you would actually be able to apply Roundup at flowering, which is not recommended currently. So it gives you some better options. Is it two genes? Uh, I don't believe it's two genes necessarily. It might be, though, Jack. <laughs> Next presenter will be uh, Dr. Frank Young with USDA Ag Research Service uh, at Pullman. Frank. Thanks, Don. Um, I've, I've concentrated all of our uh, research in the uh, uh, low to intermediate rainfall zone. Um, I guess basically uh, University of Idaho goes to basically dusty um, and then uh, they do go into the low rainfall but it's irrigated. And, and so we've kind of helped out uh, the program in the Pacific Northwest and looking at the, uh, at the low rainfall uh, zone uh, trying to establish uh, some of our uh, varieties to see what works best in, in our region. Like I said this morning, uh, boy, we've got growers up in the uh, Okanagan and uh, Douglas County that have, uh, um, for every farm up there, we could use a different variety, I think. They got weed problems, they got carryover problems, they've got uh, a lot of different things. Um, uh, this just kind of uh, reiterates what uh, uh, Mike has talked about. Our true resistant uh, canola varieties are uh, for the glyphosate, the imidazolinone, um, and the glufosinate. Um, 
uh, ammonium uh, ones, and then the tolerant ones are the sulfonylurea and uh, the emmys as as well. Uh, we've uh, over the last four years uh, we've had variety trial locations in uh, Okanagan uh, all the way to uh, Pomeroy from up north to down south. The rainfall uh, going from 10 inches to uh, 16. Um, or when we start putting them on, on Tom and Doug Poole's ranch, it'll be seven inches. Uh, the neat thing that's been fun to look at is uh, the elevation differences. We've got 1,700 feet to uh, uh, 4,100 feet, and there's quite a, quite a difference within years sometimes of locations on, on winter survival. Uh, generally, we have a lot of snow uh, on the Pomeroy location. That is if the... Uh, uh, variety trial has uh, uh, withstood all the pressure from the elk grazing uh, the, the plots, uh, which happened this year. We had knee-high canola, and just before freeze-up, we went up, and it was just flat. There was nothing but, well, there was a little green crown, but uh, so we've got a good grazing study going on at Pomeroy as well as just uh, a variety study. Uh, we... Um, Look at uh, University of Idaho varieties. Uh, not certainly not every one, but I generally converse with Jack and Jim uh, before our, our winter plantings, fall plantings, and see what they would like out. Uh, same with uh, with Mike. Uh, he sends us a lot of uh, um, varieties, and then the crop plan, of course, uh, and then uh, uh, Spectrum Crop Development provides us with a lot of the uh, European. Um, varieties that we see, Rubisco and then uh, uh, Monsanto. Uh, we have been looking at 4615. We dropped that this year, but it was a uh, has been a, a pretty good uh, performer for us in, in these regions. Um, depending on the conditions, uh, like I said, if we go into the wheat fallow area, we've got traditional fallow as well as we have uh, uh, chem fallow that's starting. Uh, we, uh, in our uh, traditional fallow, we'll use a modified uh, John Deere HZ. Uh, we take out every other uh, um, opener, and we've got 28-inch row spacing. And we do this because a lot of times our soil moisture is uh, four inches down, and uh, we certainly don't want uh, those those little seedlings to have to climb through four inches of hot uh, hot soil. So what we do is uh, we put potato shovels on it and that removes uh, uh, moves quite a bit of soil off into the adjacent uh, uh, inter-row areas, but if we kept it at 14 inches, those rows would be covered. And uh, actually, it has worked uh, very nice in, uh, in, in some of our trials. And then uh, we, we had AgPro build us a uh, um, no-till drill on 16-inch row spacing uh, that, that we've used uh, very nicely. It, it uh, distributes seed by uh, uh, an air seed uh, system. And that's the one we use that uh, um, Lauren is talking about where we went through uh, with chest high stripper header uh, stubble and have successfully planted uh, uh, no-till uh, canola into stripper header standing stubble. Well, we began um, um, four years ago, like I said, uh, in 2012. Uh, we had two sites in Okanagan and, and Bridgeport. The seeding dates are listed up there as well. Um, talking about maturity differences, we, we did apply uh, pod sealant on our plots. Um, we harvested four of the seven um, um, varieties that year. Uh, four of them were ready. Uh, we harvested those, uh, waited for the other three to uh, uh, become mature, and uh, went home, did other work, came back, and 100% uh, loss. Unfortunately, I didn't mind that, but unfortunately, the, the grower's surrounding field was 100% loss as well. Uh, it was one heck of a storm that, uh, that went through. Uh, I, I think uh, somebody up above was trying to tell us something on that site. Uh, about a week before the hailstorm hit, we had the uh, uh, aircraft pilot uh, crash and burn about uh, 50 yards from our plots. And uh, so uh, uh, we had four of them that survived quite a, quite a bit of catastrophe going on up there. 
At Bridgeport, uh, we were pretty similar in, in yield. Uh, fall staff uh, uh, did quite well uh, that year, one of the uh, conventional bread uh, varieties from, uh, from Europe. This is our, uh, our winter survival and uh, canola yields uh, in Pomeroy um, in 2012-2013 and, uh, and Ralston. Um, I just want to backtrack and say we look at yield, we look at survival, and lately we've been work looking at uh, establishment, um, especially since we've started going no-till. And uh, University of Idaho program um, runs uh, uh, oil quality and quantity for us as well. And we share all of our information with the companies as well as uh, Jack and uh, Mike uh, as, as we go. I've circled some of the ones uh, during that year that uh, did very well uh, consistently. Um, we had Amanda that uh, uh, looks very good from Jack's program uh, and, and fall staff uh, were pretty consistent both locations that year. And this past year, uh, we had a lot of growers. What I'm getting them to do is let's use Roundup Ready Canola once to start really getting your, your weeds cleaned up, your grass weeds, come back with your fallow wheat, fallow, and then come back with a conventional herbicide. Um, and uh, then you can use a, a post, a sure to select whatever you, to uh, um, um, rotate with our, our uh, um, mode of action herbicides. And uh, I've been recommending Amanda and Falstaff for up in the North region and several farmers used them this year and were quite pleased with it. Uh, Griffin did, uh, gr did very well. The interesting thing to see at this, uh, on this slide is uh, the same varieties, uh, the percent survival at Pomeroy was in the 60s and 70s, and the uh, same varieties had a uh, 80 to 90 percent survival um, at, uh, at Ralston uh, during that year. So the environment certainly plays, plays a difference in, in what our, our survival is. Uh, this last year, 2013, 2014, we had uh, five locations out. Uh, it was uh, quite dry. Uh, we lost a couple of them to uh, uh, um, dry conditions that uh, they didn't even emerge and establish. We also looked at, uh, had a couple of them that uh, uh, died over winter, which we'll also take a, take a look at. Um, you can see that was the year we started our establishment. And uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, real, it's on a one to five basis with one being poor and five being uh, um, uh, just out of sight, really good. You could hardly see a skip, uh, uh, skip in the field. The thing that, that, that shows though is, uh, let's take a look at WC1 um, establishment uh, 24, uh, of three gave us uh, a very nice uh, yield down there. The survival, uh, we've got four of them that went over 100%. Um, we, we had some crop up over winter. Uh, um, what we do is we go in and measure off a one meter uh, area in the row, count the number of plants in the fall, come back in the spring and see how many survived. Well, in those cases, we had uh, a few of them germinate and emerge and establish over winter uh, in between when we made our counts um, from the fall to the spring. Um, most of those did not go on to yield. They were crowded out and, uh, and whatnot. But uh, we had Eddie Max and uh, Safran. That was the first year that we put uh, Robisco varieties in. And uh, um, of all of them that we looked at, uh, Largo is a Rapa uh, species, and uh, all the others are, are Napus. Uh, 2014 was, was a real killer, excuse the pun, but uh, boy, from Highway 2 to uh, south to Connell, a uh, little bit west of uh, Lynn to almost uh, Dusty, uh, we just had almost a complete wipeout of, uh, of canola uh, this past year. Right around Ralston, where we have our big uh, project going, um, uh, Curtis planted uh, Largo and Falstaff in uh, several hundred acres in, in the two fields uh, near our plots. Uh, we had planted uh, Sumner in the traditional fallow. We used Sumner because uh, we put uh, the previous year that we had winter wheat, we, had, uh, uh, we put the maximum rate of Maverick on for uh, grass control. 
And then in our no-till plots uh, where we had the conventional header, uh, uh, stubble height, and the stripper header, uh, uh, Kim Fallow, uh, stubble height, uh, we had CP 115 and everything was butchered. Uh, there, wasn't, uh, there wasn't anything on your left or on your right uh, shows the, the root and the, on the crown, what was left after. We, we had below freezing temperatures in January and uh, uh, Curtis did it go below zero in February or at least zero. Um, and uh, that second one is what, uh, what really hurt us. Um, this year, uh, we've got uh, three sites out, uh, all of them going really good. Uh, as I said, uh, we got the grazing study going on at Pomeroy uh, this year, but uh, Okanagan and uh, uh, Soton. Um, Okanagan, when we planted it, it was real dry, but since then we've had a deluge of rain and uh, things look, uh, look really nice. Um, uh, Soton, uh, we had real good uh, moisture uh, at planting at uh, Mark Green's farm uh, down there and uh, not terribly much difference. So you can see that when we got rain, no till or not, we got pretty good emergence no matter uh, what variety we used. Uh, Okanagan, where it was very questionable, we were picking up, uh, uh, picking up a little bit of differences going from uh, three to uh, uh, over, over four on some of them. Um, th this is currently, or not currently, but just before freeze up, this is what our uh, variety trial looks at, looked like in Okanagan. It really improved from day of planting to going into the winter based on uh, what our soil moisture and precipitation, what we received up there. Uh, there'd be weeks that they would get a little over an inch and it uh, really assisted with, uh, with the establishment. I guess that's it, uh, appreciate it, and I certainly appreciate all the uh, uh, cooperative work with the companies as well as Jack and uh, Mike's program. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. The next presenter and last of this session, uh, Dr. Jack Brown. Uh, Jack's at the University of Idaho. He's the canola, rapeseed, mustard breeder at the University of Idaho. Jack. Thank you, Don. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say very much the same as the other two speakers, just talk about different cultivars and one or two different priorities, if you like. As Don had said, I am the canola, rapeseed, and mustard breeder. So uh, our program in Idaho is a little bit different from other commercial or uh, other university programs. Uh, for a number of reasons, and I'm going to cover that first. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some variety trial results we have in the Pacific Northwest. And, uh, and then I'm going to talk about just some things I'm going to talk about. <laughs> Start off a little bit like Mike. This is the Pacific Northwest. And, and we, uh, as a region in the USA, uh, aren't really a region at all. We're a whole series of different regions. We have an irrigated region in the middle, the Columbia Basin irrigated region. Of course, we've got another irrigated region in southern Idaho, uh, which, believe it or not, I had uh, was fortunate enough to tour in the last couple of weeks and talk to people about canola down there. And suffice to say, I had no idea where southern Idaho was until last week. I've only been here 24 years. Uh, so I've done more work in the irrigated region of Washington than I have in the irrigated region of, of Idaho, rather uh, sad. Uh, we also have, uh, uh, on your right-hand side there, from Spokane down through Pullman and Moscow, we have a higher rainfall region. So in the irrigated region, of course, we're going to be growing winter canola, irrigated. Then we have a large region uh, with much lower rainfall and without having irrigation, which is a fallow crop region. And, uh, and of course, in that region, the most productive canola is going to be winter canola planted into summer fallow. Then in the higher regions where you want a continuous cropping system, the crop of choice for oil seeds is going to be canola. As you uh, get into the slightly drier regions and, and maybe some of the regions that Frank is discussing as well, you may want to move away from canola or rapeseed and, and consider growing one of the mustards, either yellow mustard or red oriental mustard, which would fit into an annual cropping system. and. Uh, and, and I hate to knock this at the Oilseed Commission, but in southern Idaho, I had to actually tell more farmers in the dry land regions that they should be growing mustard than I did tell them to grow canola. 
And uh, I was quite surprised down in southern Idaho, they're contracting yellow mustard for 37 cents a pound, which is uh, quite attractive compared to 17 cent canola. Anyhow, there's all these different crops. So our breeding program, in uh, many ways, is controlled by the region. So we don't grow or breed or develop one kind of crop. We grow winter canola, and we also develop cultivars of winter rapeseed. We develop cultivars of spring canola and also spring rapeseed. We develop cultivars of yellow condiment mustard, oriental or Indian condiment mustard, and we also develop cultivars way outside the seed area where we actually develop cultivars that have super high glucosinolates in the plant tissue that can be used for either green manure or to actually crush the oil out and use the seed meal as a biopesticide. So we have a rather broad spectrum view of the type of cultivars we're trying to develop. What we've tried to do in the last 10 years, certainly, is to try and concentrate our efforts into efforts in areas where other commercial people uh, aren't doing work. Uh, this is the team at the University of Idaho. Uh, that's me at the top, a thinner me. Next time you see me, it's going to be a thinner me. In case you're wondering why I look so thin now, it's because I'm not drinking alcohol anymore, uh, at least not until tonight. Uh, but yeah, I am on a diet. I have got this big thing to lose some weight. Uh, the person that really runs the program is not here, is in the session next door, Jim Davis. And, and Jim and I have worked together for 24 years now at the university. Uh, although Megan hates the picture, Megan <laughs> runs all our oilseed chemistry. She also runs our greenhouse operation and various other things in the program. And the, the newest addition to our program is sitting at the front, Bradley, or Brad, uh, who started about a year ago, April. Uh, and so, so he's the new kid on the block. The program's really run by the four of us. Uh, however, we're highly dependent on graduate students who are our workforce because they're the cheapest form of labor. We have two here, Katie and Sage, and we have another one floating around somewhere, Petey. And we also in, in, uh, employ between five and six undergraduates. So we have a commitment to the farmers in the area uh, to produce genetically enhanced and improved cultivars of canola, rapeseed, and mustard. We also have a commitment to the university to educate students. So, so we, we never try to forget that at the end of the road. And it makes us different, of course, from other commercial companies, because training graduate students and also undergrads in agriculture is a major part of our job. The breeding objectives we have, irrespective of what that program is, is to enhance yield. Yield is by far the biggest component Oil content is important, but I may add that oil content, although it's recorded on every single plot, either two-row plot, six-row plot, 12-row plot, big plot, small plot, we always record oil content. I must say, a good cultivar that has very high oil content and low yield will never, ever be a cultivar from our program. So oil content is important only if it's combined with yield. Quality, as you'll see in a second, is an extremely important component to us. We are interested in fuel production as well as food production. And so you'll see a very big facet of our program is to modify the fatty acid profile of vegetable oil, in the case of rapeseed here, to develop biodiesel and also, more importantly recently, biojet fuel. And of course, we're quite unique in that. We're also highly interested in improving the meal characteristics, particularly the protein and the fiber characteristics, and, and, and added to that, perhaps the seed coat characteristics of the seed to increase the protein content and reduce the proportion of seed coat in the overall meal product to increase the value of the meal. We're aiming specifically to reduce inputs. We have a new disease on the block in the Pacific Northwest where blackleg has raised its ugly head. And all of a sudden, after 24 years, I realized we've never actively screened for blackleg. So we started a blackleg screening program this year. And you'll see we'll add it to what is our genomic-wide association study by screening every uh, accession that we have in the program for black leg resistance, as well as introducing, thanks to Mike, here are some of the black leg resistance for his program and European programs. Insect resistance is very important to us, particularly uh, cabbage seed pod weevil and aphids that come in late in the year, along with other <coughs> abiotic stress factors. Quality in canola is everything. People grow canola uh, primarily because of the high quality food grade fatty acid profile that comes with the oil. 
it's already a lower and saturated fat than any other vegetable oil, and that makes standard canola. There are two other specialty canolas in the market right now that have been for a little while, but more and more important, low linolenic or low lin canola with less than 2% linolenic acid content, and high oleic, low linolenic or hall canola, which is greater than, it says 80% here, but rather greater than 75% oleic acid, less than 6% linoleic acid, and less than 2% linolenic acid. These oils carry a premium right now, I think in the next five years, everyone will be growing either a low lin or a hall, because the premium for the food industry is going to be high enough that these oils can be used in the fry industry without transterification, not transterification, hydrogenation, uh, which uh, means that there's zero trans fat oils. Black leg, as I say, has come into the area. I don't know if you're aware, it's been spotted in the uh, Willamette Valley. It was spotted in Bonner's Ferry a few years ago, and we found some in Idaho around about Tammany last year, which must have come from some of the local mustard weeds. Uh, so we're greatly increasing the black leg screening in our program to make sure we're not caught with our trousers down. We are uh, fortunate at the University of Idaho, we are the genotype phenotype uh, uh, sector of a large biojet fuel project which involves a lot of USDA ARS people doing everything from economics down to agronomy. Uh, and our part of that, or part of our part of that is to do a genomic wide association study where we have grown every genotype available in the Brassicanapis collection in the USDA. We've added a lot of germplasm from Europe and Asia that we happen to have floating around that somebody may have brought back in their pockets to the University of Idaho, somehow turned up there. Uh, we've done a full genotype uh, a classification of all this germplasm. We're in the third year of doing a phenotype evalu evaluation, uh, which will be the largest genomic-wide association study looking at QTLs as well as markers that people are using breeding programs. <coughs> So our breeding program is heavily involved in field trials. We are also involved in tissue culture. One of the projects Brad will be undertaking is looking at microsporogenesis to accelerate the production of hybrids in a breeding program. We will probably have a wider spectrum of molecular markers than any other group by the end of our genomic-wide association study. We're trying to introduce disease testing, mainly blackleg, and with one of the most fully integrated quality labs under Megan's control in the country. Within our program, we evaluate about 10,500 head row plots every year. That's 10,500 different genotypes introduced to the program every year. About 6,500 spring and 4,000 winter types every year. We combined harvest 3,648 plots last year. It was 1,350 off station, 2,298 on station. And then just to add insult to that, Katie's little project she's doing for the Idaho Oil Seed Association and Agronomy Study added another 2,000 yield harvested plots. Uh, uh, and then with the Genomic Wide Association Study, which was uh, 1,200 different individuals planted and replicated yield trials at four different locations, we seem to be planting or harvesting every single day of the year. We have had some success in cultivar development. We've developed three winter canolas. Uh, now four spring canolas, you see the lighter colours are Cara and Empire. These are two new spring canola varieties this year. We released two new yellow mustards varieties, white gold and gold field. White gold is interesting, it's a yellow mustard, it's white flowers. Which makes it an interesting uh, visual appeal when you see large fields of it. We have one winter rapeseed variety, Darola, which is taken off quite well on the east coast, which is strange, it was never developed here. Two spring rapeseeds, Sterling and Gem, and then Pacific Gold, Kodiak, and a very interesting Indian mustard, Indie Gold, which happens to be herbicide tolerant. Like Mike, we carry out variety trials for industry. We carry out what's called the Spring and Winter Pacific Northwest Canola Variety Trials. The aim here is to identify environments as well as genotypes that are suitable to grow canola throughout the varied environmental conditions that we have in the Pacific Northwest. Over the last 20 odd years, we've uh, tested uh, 616 different spring canola cultivars from 30 different companies, along with 453 different winter canola varieties from 20 different private companies, as well as the University of Idaho and some lines from Kansas State University. 
over that 20 year period there's two lines to recognize here the bottom line is the yield over the last 20 years from 1993 to 2013 of the one variety Bridger and you see over that 20 year period Bridger yield has increased by an average of 21 pounds a year that's the bottom line still going up that means that our agronomy has improved at the rate of 21 pounds of canola seed an acre if you look at the top uh, uh, line you'll see it's higher slope it means that these are the top yielding new varieties of canola and you'll see that they have increased in yield more than double to 47 and a half pounds that means over a 20-year period the yield of winter canola in the Pacific Northwest has increased by an average of 1,000 pounds an acre. 554 of these pounds per acre are caused by an improvement in the genetics and 443 pounds an improvement on the way we grow it. So we've improved not only how we grow it, but what we grow. And I think there are no other crop you'll see in the Pacific Northwest that's had that improvement in yield potential in the last 20 years, now your wheat, barley or peas. Spring canola has actually had a higher genetic component, has increased 420 pounds per acre for every new spring canola variety, and the environment has improved yield by 168 pounds. The higher proportion of genetics to agronomy in spring canola, almost certainly due to the fact that Monsanto got too much money, they're throwing probably more money at their spring canola variety trial every year than we have spent in the last 20 years in canola breeding in total. We just cannot complete this, compete with spring canola in the research dollars from Dow and Cargill and Monsanto and Syngenta, and so much so that we've cut our spring breeding program uh, to a minimum. Over the last four years, this is average yield. This is yield of winter canola planted into summer fallow or dry land winter canola. Uh, Amanda does quite well. An older variety that people seem to have forgotten from our program, Athena does very well. Erica is one of the first varieties. And you can see even the Roundup Reddies, which used to do abysmally poorly out here, mainly because there were crosses between winter canola true and spring canola to introduce the Roundup Ready characteristic, have improved quite a bit. Uh, but there's still, if you grow a Roundup Ready, it may help you kill up uh, some cures coming the weed problems you have. But take, you're going to take a two to four hundred pound hit in yield. Oh. Irrigated canola yields higher than dry land canola. What a surprise. You have water control, you increase the yield. I mean, that was a startling, a startling scientific discovery. But nonetheless, what was uh, maybe a little bit surprising is that the relative ranking, ranking of the winter canolas on dry land compared to irrigated seem to be about the same. Amanda seems to percolate to the top. Uh, in every case, and the Roundup Readies, even with irrigation, tend, tend not to have the same yield potential, but they do have the opportunity uh, to control weeds. We've not released our herbicide-tolerant winter canola yet. We will this fall. It's a numbered line now. It's a derivative of Amanda. It has imidazolone on tolerance, which gives it full tolerance to sulfonyl urea herbicides. So you can spray it with Beyond. You can spray it with Harmon Extra. Uh, and you can also plant it in soils that have high residues of these. It's as good if not higher yielding than Amanda. And uh, for the people that used to know our program, know we used to get a lot of money from a European company. They didn't like GMOs and so we never did work with GMOs. They stopped giving us money. And so we'll probably have our first Roundup Ready Emmy. So it'll be an Emmy so you can plant it on ground with high chemical residue. And, then, and a Roundup ready so you can control weeds using Roundup. We have the best winter canola in the area, but we certainly don't have the best spring canola. The DLK, like DLK 3042 Roundup ready, high class 955 Roundup ready, and then bigger, blow our spring canolas away yield wise. I don't, I don't, not any excuse here, but they just have more money and, and fewer. Uh, crops that are working with. They work only with spring canola, we do winter. We have come up with two new varieties this year. Cara, which is a clear field, allow it to be planted in soil that's been infected or been sprayed with pursuit to grow lentils uh, or peas. And we've come up with a new variety called Empire. And I say most the, both these varieties are lower yielding, and I'm not making any apology for it, than the, the hybrid Roundup Readies or the GMOs. But uh, you'll see there's quite a big demand for non-GMO, and I consider it important 
our programme stay with non-GMO spring canola just to service the people that might want to grow on market non-GMO products. As it turned out, that, that's quite a big demand. We're going to release a new winter canola variety this year called WC1. It's probably going to be the last winter canola, which is a standard canola. All our new spring canolas, we have two in foundation seed production this year. The top one there that says 5SE12, which is a low lin, and the top one two down below that, which is SC3617B2, which will be our first haul. And I think in the, uh, that they will no longer produce commodity canola from our program. All the results from our program, uh, from the variety trials in the program, uh, like others, are published on our website, and the website's at the bottom. They also have little leaflets that you can pick up outside. Uh, I just have three of them here, one for mustard, one for canola and rapeseed winter, one for canola rapeseed spring. Pick one up outside, you can get them either, either which way. Uh, I, may, I must add that last year, uh, I didn't put them up there, but last year we did have uh, some of these uh, rubisco or whatever these new varieties that are coming out there and did really well in last year's trials. I didn't put them up because we only had one year's results. One of the problems you've heard about winter canola is getting it established. And, and the reason it's a problem is we, we grow winter canola as if it's a winter annual like winter wheat. And of course it's not. It's a biennial. Uh, it's a biennial that's designed to be planted in the spring and not in the fall. It won't vernalize unless it has six leaves, unlike wheat that will vernalize when the radical comes out the seed. So winter wheat will vernalize underneath the surface of the soil. Canola will not. And so we came up with the idea that you get inconsistent yield because it's too small going into the winter because our rainfall doesn't come until September. You have to plant it in fallow, but the moisture is too deep down. You plant canola on the 1st of September, it gets a plant like this one on your left-hand side. The 30th of September, you get one that would never even vernalize. It doesn't have enough leaves to vernalize. It will die in the winter. So we came up with this bright idea. If it's hard to establish when you plant it in August, why don't you plant it in June? Because it's not really hot in June, so the soil temperature is not high, and there's tons of moisture in the summer fallow in June. And, uh, and so you can plant it in June, and quite honestly, anybody with any, even a wheat grower can plant canola in June and get it to grow. It's actually really, really quite easy. And, and I know that because I used to be a wheat breeder. I was fired from the wheat breeding program because I, I, I wouldn't do things that people wanted me to do, which was good. But I did realize in that time that I can grow wheat really easy. Anybody can grow wheat. Uh, well, even, even these people can grow canola planted early. And then we thought that, that we could have these dual purpose crops like what Mike was talking about. But unlike Mike, where he plant it late in the year, we thought, well, why don't we just plant it way early in the year, like May? And, uh, and if you plant it early in the year in May, then you can come along and you graze it. And it's actually great grazing, as Frank will find out in the springtime, uh, I don't think the temperatures have been real cold. We had elk graze our winter canola last year to literally a quarter inch from the surface of the soil, and it grew just fine. If you have canola that you plant too early, like Mike says, and it etiolates, it's going to winter out, mow it to an inch above the surface of the soil, and it won't cow out. So, so it's one of the things to do that if, if your canola is rising tall, mow it. And if you mow it, then you get some slurry, gooey, horrible looking stuff like this, uh, which is silage from canola, or as we call it, canolage. You can take canola planted in May, and you can chop it down so it looks like that about six weeks after you plant it. And if you do that, you can harvest about one and a half tons of dry matter an acre. And six weeks after you do that, you'll never tell you've been in the field because it'll be back up to your waist height again. And uh, it's quite an incredible forage crop. The forage quality is terrific. It has a relative feed value of around about 300 compared to high quality alfalfa, which has a relative feed value of 180 to 200. One of the problems we have with it is that the fiber content is too low. And so to try and get around that, the best way if you're gonna grow dual purpose canola is plant it with something that's higher fiber and lower protein, like triticale. But triticale and a, gra a grass triticale and a broadleaf don't go well together, you can't control weeds. 
So we came up with the idea that you can plant it with a spring imidazolinone or clearfield wheat, and you can plant it with a winter imi, like our winter Amanda, that's the imi, and you can spray it with Beyond to control all your weeds. And then you can harvest it when the wheat gets to the milk stage, and uh, you'll harvest dry land, average over three years study, you'll harvest between six and a half and seven and a half tons of dry matter, even at low quality hay. Uh, uh, or silage is going to come up to be about fourteen to eighteen hundred dollars in return, and then you can let the canola overwinter. The grass, of course, being spring wheat, will die out if it doesn't spray it with a sure two, and then harvest winter or, or, or canola seed in the following springtime. You can use what you harvest to make silage, which is difficult to transport, and we found in our years of feeding studies where we're really talking about feeding studies and not joking about elk, because nobody jokes about elk, you know. I, I counted, that time we had the elk, I have a picture, I counted 110 head of elk on less than a half an acre of canola research plots. And uh, we had four different plots on the farm and it went from here, single file to here, <coughs> single file to here, and here, and then disappeared. Uh, but you can feed canola down to the ground. <coughs> At the end of August, beginning of September, uh, 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 if you got that growing point low enough, it'll come back and it'll survive just well. So uh, that's me done. The question said, have you seen anybody bale canola? <coughs> Excuse me. The problem is that canola is so low in fiber, you do not have the content to bale it. One of the things we thought with the mixing with the wheat yeah. is you can bale it. Okay. The more wheat you have, or triticale, the better the chance. We've been looking at where we can actually mix a one-to-one -one plant to plant basis, which means you cut your wheat planting by two-thirds and leave your canola planting to be as it was, because wheat just tends to survive a bit better. Then you get a one plant to one plant ratio, and rather than make hay from it, uh, which has you know, about 19% moisture, you can make hay leach, which means you can bale it, but it's real wet. So it's not going to be good quality hay stored for long periods of time, but at that moisture, maybe you can move it. But uh, So yeah, by m manipulating the grass you have in there, you would be able to make some kind of hay from it. So you're saying cut, cut the wheat right back to like 30 pounds per acre? The wheat, yeah. Yeah. If, if you would normally plant 90 pounds of, of, of spring wheat, then, then cut it back two thirds to plant 30 pounds. I wouldn't plant more than, more than 45 pounds. Uh, otherwise, you'll get a lot of wheat with a little bit of canola in it. And the idea would be to have a you know, half and half. So you talk about strip feed and the, the feed value of the canola. Is it, uh, is it really hard on the cattle? I mean, can they, do they bloat? No, they do not bloat, but they do suffer from nitric toxicity. <clears throat> what, what we've been doing is, I tend to walk around, sorry. We've, been done, we've done a four-year feed study on our dairy, and our dairy manager will now take the cows uh, after the second milking and put them on overnight, where they eat less overnight anyway. Uh, the people have been uh, feeding uh, green, strip feeding, uh, that I've heard about have been using you know, quite controlled feeding by moving electric fence. And, uh, and they've been supplementing that by a high fiber uh, a hay product at the same time. Others that Don might have more information on than I have have been green feeding, where they've actually cut the canola and put it into a silage type wagon and hauled it off and fed it green. Uh, I think you had one farmer in Oregon that was doing that, is that correct? He doesn't know, he doesn't know what day it is. In the past, that's been done. Uh, it has been done in the past. I didn't make it up, really. No, it didn't. Any other questions? Yeah, Jack, I just want to make sure I wrote this down right. WC1 will be the last commercial fall canola that will be released by you? No, no, I say WC1 may be the last standard commodity type canola, which means it's canola uh, that, that has to be hydrogenated to be used as a fry oil. Okay. I think the premium, the, the, the premium I think is, is 25 cents a hundred for high oleic acid, uh, which is, you know, it, it can make the difference from making money or not. I know the, 
<clears throat> the contract on canoa this year, I think, is 17 cents. I think uh, the riding contract for 25 cent for Hyole at Canola. And now that difference between 17 cents and 25 cents at 3,500 uh, pound Canola makes a difference between making money and not making money. Another way of saying it is all future will be either low win or. Uh -huh. and, and so I'm, you know, don't hold it to me because if I have a super variety that comes that, that you know, I trip over. That, that has 5,000 pound yield and, and it's a standard canola, it's probably going to be a variety. I'm just saying it, our, our direction is more to specialised canola and specialised rapeseed. Because uh, when you make jet fuel, anybody know about jet fuel? Apart from, apart from you. Uh, well, when you, when you make jet fuel, you can actually make jet fuel from anything. Yeah, from beef fat, taro, cam, even camelina, you know that weed that people try to sell. And, and that's why they all jumped on the Camelina wagon, because you can't make, you can't make biodiesel from it, because it makes horrible biodiesel. But you make jet fuel from it. And, uh, and everybody thought, well, you can make jet fuel from anything. Well, actually, you can't. In theory, you can, but uh, in order to make jet fuel from a vegetable oil, you have to hydrogenate it. The same process we go through in the food industry to, to stop it going rancid. You have to get rid of these double and triple bonds, otherwise you don't get straight chain fatty acids and you don't get good jet fuel. That's what it is, straight chain fatty acids. And so the more polyunsaturates you have, uh, the more money it costs to make jet fuel because it's the hydrogenation process of bubbling hydrogen. The more double bonds, the more hydrogen, and, and uh, it just, it's just by far the biggest cost thing. So we've been developing industrial rapeseeds that have very, very few double and triple bonds. So something that's, uh, that's around about a 90 to 95% mono, mono unsaturated oil, between mono unsaturates and saturates. And it won't produce a better quality jet fuel, it'll just produce a jet fuel that's cheaper. Uh, and in the future, crops like canola are all going to be specialist crops. And uh, you know, we're, we're, people want a little bit edge. And I think a warden plant's a good example, you know, it's a cold, cold pressed plant. It can't possibly produce a volume that uh, ADM is going to produce. And, and so they have to produce something that's a little bit different from what's on the market. So if you're not using hexane, the obvious one is a non-GMO because the people that are prepared to buy something at high value might not want GMOs and they might want, not want hexane. Uh, and, and so if it's a non-hydrogenated one, no trans fats as well. You know, you've got to fit these niches, and, and you know, that's, that's where the money's going to be made. And, and with canola, you're going to make money right, left, and center, and I think that goes for every agricultural crop that we have in the future. We're going to have to make money on premiums from, from competing internationally with other companies. We're going to have to make money on whole crops, so we're going to have to utilize the forage and make cattle feed, strip feed to beef cattle or dairies or whatever. We're going to have to increase the value of the meal and, and, and so we're using everything. It's not just oil seed that's running the price of canola. Uh, we've got to get the profitability as high as we can. No farmer, there's no hobby farmers here. You know, all farmers you want to make money. Jack, how early did you see the canola? You're next. Sorry? How early did you see, you said you seeded the canola in May, you were gonna... I've seeded the winter canola in April. April. Uh, doesn't make any difference. Seed it whenever you like. And then when are you having to uh, eat it down? Before it blooms? Doesn't make any difference. It won't, if, you, if you seed the right winter canola in April, it will never bloom until it's gone through winter. Uh, it will have to be a true winter. Now, there's a lot of canola out there that are not true winters that will flower late in the year. Uh, so, so, yeah, I, I think it kind of depends on, on what you want to do. Quite honestly, in, in the dry land area here, I wouldn't plant in April because you will, as Frank says, you'll run out of water. You know, and now this canopy is going to stop the soil heating up, so you'll, you'll eliminate a lot of evaporation from the soil because it'll canopy, it'll mulch it, keep it cool. But it's transpiring, and, and so it's, it's using moisture. It's, it's not a moisture-free crop. So, so I tell people, I used to tell people plant as early as you could. And Michael will tell you, I used to tell him other stuff as well that they all laugh about as well. Mike's smirking. 
Uh, but now, now what we kind of say is don't, don't plant as early as you, 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 you can. Plant as early as you want. So if you have cows and you can feed this, either green feeding or strip feeding, you can plant in May. But you've got to feed it every eight weeks. So, so again, plant for what you need. If you've, got, if you've got enough cows to strip feed it once a week and move a fence once a week, because then you can plant enough to accommodate that. Uh, even if you, plant, if you plant too early and it, and it etiolates and you're not going to feed it, you have to get rid of all that foliage. You have to mulch it down. You have to mow it. And it'll give it a lot of some protection. It'll recycle your nutrients, give you some mineralization nitrogen in the springtime, control some of your weeds. Uh, but, but otherwise, what will happen is when you, when you plant canola uh, and normally, although it's a winter, uh, a biennial, the buds have to acclimate to winter. And the problem has it when your canola etiolates and gets like this, the stem, although it doesn't bolt, the buds you know, separate like this. And so the buds are exposed above the ground, quite high above the ground, and so they're not in a nice little cluster or the rosette, as it would be called, and, and which means that they're rather sensitive. Now, if you chop that crop off to about an inch above the surface of the soil, there's enormous quantities of sugar in that root system that is as big as the foliage above. There'll be 2,000 pounds of root mass. And if you get some rain on that in September, what will happen is the buds, which may come even from below the ground, are going to come up, and they're going to come up in just like new little bud clusters on, on a newly planted seed. 